Um, welcome students. Hello. Uh, I hope you're having a good day. Uh, my name is Amanda Long. I'm the Fine Arts Coordinator at Stevenson. Of course, you know Ms. Hyken, and we're here today with Courtney Madison, our visiting artist. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to check out her um, artist statement and bio. If not, it's um, on the Visiting Artist website, as well as her digital exhibition um, with tons of samples of her work, which I think we'll see some more of today. Um, I'm just going to give you a few bio highlights and then I'll pass it to Courtney. Um, but I should, I, I'll say along the way, if you've got questions, go ahead and type them into um, the chat or you can submit them through the Q&A and I'll keep track of that. And Courtney, if it's okay with you, I'll just jump in every now and then if the students have a question, um, but we can have a, a specific time, a few minutes at the end, I'll give you a give you a note and um, we'll stop for any further questions. Um, so uh, Courtney is our, a California artist. She was born and raised in San Francisco and now lives and works in LA. Um, she has work all over the world. She's been commissioned internationally to create work for the US Embassy in Jakarta and the Lindblad Ex Expeditions National Geographic Endurance Ship. A mouthful and a really cool piece of work. Um, her exhibition history includes shows at Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art, the U.S. Department of Commerce headquarters, and the Lux Art Institute. Um, this was a fun note to see. Um, in 2020, the United Nations Postal Administration published Courtney's work on a stamp to commemorate Earth Day. You'll have to tell us more about that. That's very cool. Um, she has a Bachelor of Arts in Marine Ecology and Ceramic Sculpture, Sculpture from Skidmore College and a Master of Arts degree in Environmental Studies from Brown University. Her work has been featured in Smithsonian Magazine, Good Morning America, Oprah Magazine, and the BBC. Um, so we're so grateful to have you with us today. Um, this, this year of Art Talks has been really special for us because we get to chat with artists outside of the Chicagoland area. So um, we're really grateful for you being here and um, I'll pass it to you. If you'd like to share your screen at any point, go ahead. Otherwise, um, it's all yours. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And um, uh, I know that it's kind of a weird time right now, but hopefully this will kind of transport you to some warm, far off places. And I'll show you a little bit about uh, the research and the field work that I do that informs my work. So um, I am lucky I get to, in normal times, get to travel all around the world. Um, and so I'm excited to share all of that with you. Um, I'll try to keep it to around 20, 25 minutes, and then we can have time for a little conversation at the end, um, but um, I'll time myself and we'll see how we do. So um, I basically, uh, I'm sitting in my studio in Los Angeles right now. Um, this is a work behind me that I'll show you in this uh, little slideshow, but basically I create large scale ceramic sculptural works that are inspired by coral reef conservation issues. Um, and especially climate change. There's a famous oceanographer and also a mentor of mine whose name is Sylvia Earle. Uh, she's a National Geographic Society explorer in residence. And she often says, no water, no life, no blue, no green. And I think that's a really interesting message. Without water, um, life on earth wouldn't exist. And Dr. Earl is also fond of saying that without water, we'd have a planet a lot like Mars. Uh, we're all connected by water, no matter where we live. If you're in the middle of the country or right by the coast, um, all of us are connected to the sea from the icy peaks of the Rocky Mountains to the glittering reefs of Southeast Asia. And we all make a difference um, and we all affect the health of the ocean with carbon dioxide we emit from driving in cars and flying in airplanes or um, the food we eat, the fish we eat, um, it all plays a role in this giant connected ecosystem on our planet. And I've had the opportunity to travel to really amazing places to see coral reefs in very healthy states. I think it's, um, I feel really lucky because not many people get the chance to see really healthy, thriving coral reefs in the wild. And so I do my part to bring those above the surface and try to get people as excited about them as I am. 
Um, I'm happiest when the kind of colorful branches and venomous appendages of a healthy coral reef are kind of dancing through the window of my scuba mask as I hover above. And so I find that really exciting. And I also find it really sculptural. Uh, corals are animals, which a lot of people don't realize, and they precipitate their skeletons out of calcium carbonate, uh, which is like limestone, basically. Um, so they're sculptors, they're sculpting the reef. And so I find that to be a really interesting concept um, that I think about a lot in my own work. I've encountered some really strange creatures. This is Wally the humphead wrasse that I met in Australia. Um, I just think that the ocean is so, it's like an alien universe, but it's on our planet. And so that has always really excited me. Um, and I feel like the ocean is kind of an endless muse of inspiration for my work because every time I think I'm creating something really out there, I'll go scuba diving and see something even more zany looking. So the ocean is way more creative than I could ever be. Um, in recent years, I've been traveling a lot to Indonesia and that is at the heart of a gigantic region called the Coral Triangle, which is uh, something that ecologists have termed to identify this area that has like really, really immense biodiversity, a lot, a lot of species all in one place underwater. Um, so that diversity of different species makes the reef especially healthy. It keeps it really resilient to threats like fishing and climate change and pollution, which are three of the main threats to coral reefs around the world. Um, and uh, ecologists often say that the Coral Triangle is kind of like the Amazon rainforest underwater for that reason. So it's really, really special. Um, and it provides a ton of resources to the people that live in that region. So people get so many countless benefits from the reef being healthy, like food and coastal protection and um, all kinds of kind of indirect benefits that you wouldn't normally think about. And you've probably heard that coral reefs are really threatened. Climate change is causing the sea temperature to warm up. And so uh, corals are really sensitive to changes in temperature and they react with sort of an immune response. It's sort of like when they get a fever. Um, and so corals have these tiny little microscopic algae that live inside their skin essentially and they photosynthesize, they get energy from the sun to create sugars that are a really important food source for the coral that hosts them. So the coral, if it has this immune response, like a fever and kind of ejects or evicts these little algae that live in its skin, essentially begins to starve and um, it becomes really susceptible to disease. So coral bleaching often leads to the death of corals on the reef which can be a really big issue. Um, and if we don't do enough to curb climate change and other threats to reefs like fishing um, and harmful fishing practices, then um, reefs are expected to essentially disappear by the middle of this century, only about 30 years from now. It's really, really urgent and sad. Um, and I, that doom and gloom isn't inspiring. That's not gonna help inspire people to protect reefs. I think hope and a personal connection are really important to inspiring people to care. And so that's why I use my art um, because I think that we protect what we care about and we care about what we know and understand. If we don't know, why would we care to do anything differently to protect the ocean if we don't think about how we personally are connected to that threat? I think art and science have a lot in common in terms of how we explore and explain the world. I think there's a shared sense of curiosity between artists and scientists that um, have, it's, they just have a lot in common. And the combination of art and science, I think can be greater than the sum of its parts. I think um, I try to use my art to translate scientific concepts from climate change and ocean acidification and coral bleaching and all these kind of technical things into 
um, artworks that I hope will be kind of emotionally impactful and get people to have that spark of curiosity and wonder that made me first fall in love with coral reefs and want to learn about how to protect them. So when I was a master's candidate at Brown University back in 2011, I decided I wanted to figure out how to make a masterpiece. Uh, I didn't know what that meant, but I wanted to create something that would inspire people to care about protecting coral reefs. And so I spent a couple years taking courses both at Brown and environmental studies, and then also at the Rhode Island School of Design um, studying ceramic sculpture. And I interviewed some of my heroes in art and science about the potential for art to inspire coral reef conservation. So this is the work I ended up creating as the culmination of my thesis project that was kind of informed by those interviews. And it shows a transition from healthy, colorful corals at eye level up into that process of coral bleaching and algal domination that I was talking about um, when algae kind of smothers the reef after the corals die. And that really kind of launched me into the career I have today. I kind of created this niche and um, discovered that I could have more of a voice as an artist than necessarily as a scientist, even though most of my educational background is in marine ecology and science, I decided I could uniquely contribute more uh, as an artist who kind of translates those ideas. So that's what I do today. And um, I'll show you some images of my work. Um, essentially, uh, this is called Our Changing Seas 3. This is the work that's behind me right here in my studio. Um, I think the idea of incorporating spiral forms that occur in so many different places in nature is a powerful way to kind of toss coral reefs up in the air and kind of imply that their future is really in the balance. Um, it's in our hands and I don't necessarily want people to interpret my work pessimistically. I think I want viewers to interpret the work for themselves and you can see it swirling inwards or outwards. This is a photo of me in front of it for scale. It's about 14 by 10 feet. A lot of my work is very three-dimensional. It sticks off the wall up to 22 inches. Um, and I think that's an interesting way to kind of get people to approach the work and um, discover details from every angle. And it's sort of the way I feel when I'm hovering over a reef when I'm scuba diving. Um, so that's why I often put my work on the wall. And then of course I show that transition from colorful healthy corals to sickened and bleached ones because I think coral reefs offer us a really stark visualization of climate change. Climate change can be really, really tough to relate to and to visualize. And so I think the power of coral reefs is partly in that really dramatic, abrupt transition they make from colorful to bleached, because it helps us visualize it. This is another work called Our Changing Seas 4. Um, and again, I incorporated some spiral forms. This one, I was looking at a lot of um, spiral forms from like galaxy spirals even, kind of getting farther out there. This one's about 17 feet wide and 11 feet tall. And it stick, it's very three-dimensional. It sticks off the wall about 22 or 23 inches. Hundreds of pieces. Um, and this is one that I created as a private commission back in 2019. And this is the work that was included on the stamp for the United Nations to commemorate Earth Day last year. Um, so I was excited to be involved in that project. The stamps, it's not postal st postage stamps like with USPS. So unfortunately, apparently you can only mail things within the United Nations, um, which maybe one day I'll go to New York and try that, I don't know. <laughs> um, this is the largest work I've created yet. It's called Confluence, Our Changing Seas 5, and it's enormous. That's me sitting at the bottom for, um, reference. It's about 28 feet tall and a little over 18 feet wide. And I created it as a commission for 
the US State Department's Office of Art and Embassies, and it's a permanent public artwork for the um, US Embassy in Jakarta, which opened in 2018. So I'll show you a little bit about my design process. Um, I always start with a hand-drawn sketch that I just do with pen and ink and colored pencil. And then I can put that into Photoshop and kind of superimpose it onto architectural renderings. Um, and this is one that the embassy team gave me when I was proposing the work. My work looks really organic, but it's really, really meticulously measured. So um, like I don't even start building until I figure out exactly how big each piece is going to be and exactly where the hardware is going to go on the wall for each piece. It's sort of like a gigantic puzzle. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of planning and measuring involved. And then Courtney, I, a couple, yeah. um, two different folks popped in and are curious about how long the work takes. So I wonder as you talk through the process, if you'd give us like, I'm sure it's different for every piece, but a ballpark of your timeline. Sure. So um, this work uh, is the biggest one I've ever made. So this one took about a year to complete. I think the actual building process took about eight months. Um, but this is on the floor of my studio in LA. So um, my studio floor wasn't even big enough to fit more than half of the work at a time. So I had to create everything uh, in two different phases basically. And uh, this is me just sort of texturing the work. I use really simple tools like chopsticks and paint brushes and um, create all the textures by hand. This is kind of a bird's eye shot of when I was uh, creating the lower half of that work on the floor. So you can see the lines on the floor are kind of part of my map. Um, and the building process really takes the most time. I think glazing the really colorful pieces is really intricate also. So that can often take as long as it takes to build, but like just this brown kind of central swirl piece which is about 25 inches wide. Uh, that alone took me about a week to make, um, but that's also the most intricate piece in the whole work. So each piece takes me on average about three days to build. And then maybe one day for the smaller pieces. So it's really labor intensive. I ended up having to go to physical therapy after <laughs> this project because it was pretty intense. Um, just like 10 hours a day of sculpting. I had very sore shoulders and fingers. Um, but this is when the pieces were glazed and coming out of the kiln and then being reassembled so I could make sure my measurements were all correct. Um, and then we were able to hire a great um, art handling company to pack everything up and ship it to Indonesia for installation. And so back in I guess it was October 2018, we traveled to Jakarta and um, I worked with a great team of art handlers to install the work. And we had to get up like 30 feet up in the air on the wall um, with scissor lift. So it was very technical. Uh, and I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to construction equipment. So I had a lot of fun with that stuff. But um, this is a shot of the install, the finishing touches of the like upper tail of that swirl. Um, and again, with this design, I think the hurricane spiral is a really powerful image in terms of kind of implying connections between climate change causing more dramatic weather patterns and things like that. So that's part of what I did. Um, and it was kind of funny because the cafeteria is right next to the upper portion of the wall. So people would come out of the cafeteria and try to talk to us while we were on the scissor lifts, which was kind of distracting. Um, but this is a detail shot of the finished work. This is one I created and finished back in 2019 called Malum Geminos for a show at the Florence Griswold Museum in Connecticut. Malum Geminos means evil twins in Latin, and it's inspired by Dr. Jane Lubchenco, who is, uh, she was the administrator of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, but now she was just recently appointed the White House's 
deputy director of um, climate and policy, I believe. I forget exactly what her title is, but she's um, an amazing marine scientist. And back in 2009, she was at the Copenhagen Climate Talks and said that ocean acidification is like the equally evil twin of climate change for coral reefs. So I thought about those evil twins and, and tried to create a piece kind of designed to, to match that concept. So the corals are bleached and they're very skeletal looking and there's some, this is me sitting under it, it's about 21 feet wide. Um, there are some kind of gelatinous polyps that are sort of dissolving and um, kind of oozing around amid the really skeletal, skeletal um, structures of this work. So I had fun with that one. It's a little bit different. And this is a shot in the gallery during that show. This is in my studio when I was creating that work. You can see it kind of along the floor on the right side. Um, and this is the other largest work I've done. This was a group project though. It's a community-based art project that I designed and kind of led the production of. So um, this is called Semesta Terumbu Karang, which means coral universe in Indonesian. Um, and this is in Bali. It's a work that was commissioned by the Coral Triangle Center, which is a nonprofit in Bali that was opening a new center for marine conservation um, that they hope will be visited by tourists and locals and really inspire people to learn more about coral reef conservation. So they have a lot of exhibits and kind of learning stations. And this work is intended to be kind of the inspiring heart of the center. Um, and so I ended up uh, visiting Bali for the first time in 2016 to start thinking about this work. And then over the course of about two years, uh, we collaborated with hundreds of people. This is the director of the center with her mom and a friend um, creating anemones during one of the workshops. But we had dozens of workshops where individual people would come in and create their own pieces that we would fire and finish and glaze um, to incorporate into the, the overall design, which is about 61 feet long. It's really gigantic. Um, so I flew out a few different times to do workshops and then I would do weekly Skype calls for about a year with our core team. This guy in the black shirt kind of down front right was the local um, artist from Indonesia who helped uh, kind of coordinate the project and make all the workshops happen while I was back in the US. And there was an amazing uh, ceramic kind of production factory called Jengala Ceramic, which does a lot of tableware, but they um, donated a lot of resources and time and um, production time to create about half of the work for this installation. So that's me kind of picking out glazes at their facility during the process. It took about 12 days, full days to install this work. We had about 2000 individual pieces that needed to be attached individually to the wall using anchors and epoxy. So it was a pretty intense process. Um, this is the overall design and the finished work. We had sort of a panorama image created of it. Um, and the design is inspired by the six different countries of the Coral Triangle. So in addition to Indonesia, it's the Philippines, Malaysia, Papua New Guinea, um, Solomon Islands, and Timor-Leste. So those countries are all really immensely diverse and they're all really um, at the heart of this region that is so important for coral reefs around the world. Uh, and the central kind of, the central bullseye form is a reference to how that region is also called the bullseye of biodiversity. And I did a press conference with the former ambassador to uh, Indonesia from the US. He came out when we debuted um, and unveiled the work in Bali. Um, so we did a press conference for CNN Indonesia and talked about how this work could be used sort of as a teaching tool um, and also a way to form collaborations between the US and Indonesia to inspire collaboration for conservation. 
Um, and these workshops that we did at the Coral Triangle have kind of blossomed into a whole new side project. So the Coral Triangle Center today hosts uh, choral workshops that you can go to. And I was there back in 2019 and hosted one. I think they do them every Monday and they're hopefully gonna be able to restart them soon um, if things reopen with COVID and everything. Um, and then back in 2019, I was also invited to go to return to Indonesia and do a cultural exchange with art and embassies hosted by the um, embassy in Jakarta and the consulate in a place called Surabaya. And so we traveled around Indonesia to different high schools and universities doing workshops where each student would create an individual coral assemblage. And it was a great way to start conversations about why coral reefs are so important. Like they're right in the backyards of all these kids. And so a lot of them have don't know how to swim. A lot of them don't value reefs in the way that um, they could if they put their faces underwater and sort of appreciated um, the value of these reefs in the wild. And so it's an, another example of how awareness is so key to um, promoting conservation. Um, and so this is another shot from a high school we visited in Alor in Eastern Indonesia. When Dr. Sylvia Earle, who I mentioned at the beginning, won the TED Prize, she founded a organization that I work with called Mission Blue. And when you win the TED Prize, you get to make a wish. And so I thought her wish was really powerful. So I'll kind of close with this. Um, she says, I wish you would use all means at your disposal, films, the web, expeditions, new submarines, a campaign to ignite public support for a network of global marine protected areas, hope spots large enough to save and restore the ocean, the blue heart of the planet. So I've taken that idea to heart and try to use my art to do what I can to protect hope spots. Um, and so I would just hope that all of you are inspired to do the same. So I'm happy to answer questions and um, have a little conversation if we still have time. We do. Yeah, we've got just over 10 minutes. Courtney, Great. thank you so much. It's so wonderful to see your work. Um, we did have a question come in, um, sort of a, a double parter. Um, a student wrote, it's really cool to see how you use your art to advocate for something that you care about and connect it to science. Um, she was wondering, how do you balance between creating art and using your scientific knowledge? Um, she was also interested in how you use references in your art, if, it, if you work primarily from images. Mm -hmm. So finding a balance between doing science and art has become more, a little easier in recent years because I've decided to take on um, you know, full-time um, studio practice. So I work full-time as an artist now, but I do still try to go on expeditions when I can. So I work with Mission Blue and they conduct expeditions to different hope spots around the world. And so I actually help them plan expeditions. So that's kind of how I tap into the science side and try to stay up to date um, in addition to kind of reading the literature. But um, sorry. Do you ever, do you anticipate ever returning to like you're the balance shifting or hard to say mm, if you'd ever go I back into I mean, I feel like I'm in a really good groove now. I think my work is so big that I really need to work on commission most of the time. So it's always kind of uncertain, like how long those, that kind of stream of commissions will last, but it's been steady for the last five or six years. So as long as I'm able to ride that wave, I'm going to, I'm having fun with that. So We'll see, I don't know. That's great. The other, the other half of the question was about um, using references in your art right? Um, yes. and working from images. I imagine you must work from your memory and experience quite a bit too, having been with the reefs so often. I do, I do. And when I go diving, I always bring a camera. I'm not good at underwater photography, but it's sort of like a scavenger hunt when I'm diving. I, I always go around and collect inspiration and kind of think about things that I want to incorporate into my designs later. Mm -hmm. So um, I often don't even look at the pictures later or I will just sort of briefly and then I'll, I try not to be too literal in terms of the taxonomy and the structures of the corals um, species wise because I don't necessarily want them to be like natural history dioramas. I want my work to 
focus more on sparking that sense of wonder that I feel when I'm diving and the excitement. And so I'll often create my own kind of fantastical hybrids of different species. And Thank you for speaking stuff. to that. I was curious about that too, whether you'd take sort of like an artistic license with like the colors or the particular yeah. interesting shapes or something. Definitely. Yeah. I try to keep it in form. Like I've had so much time on reefs and so I do stay informed about kind of like the color palette and things like that. I try to be pretty realistic with it, but um, yeah, I definitely take some artistic license. <laughs> Rightfully, there's a lot of work that you produce. <laughs> yes. um, another question was um, when, oh, this is fun. When was the first time you worked with clay and mm -hmm. when did you know you wanted to pursue fine arts as a career? That's a great question, which I should have included in my talk. It's so silly. I didn't because you can I now. started in high school. Yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe this afternoon I'll include that. But um, I uh, was, I grew up on the California coast. I was always fascinated by the ocean and I was always an artsy kid. But when I was in high school, when I was 17, I was able to, my high school offered a marine biology class um, that was like an alternate to an AP. So I took that class and just became totally fascinated and obsessed with marine invertebrates, um, like sea sponges and tunicates that just seemed so strange to me and I was so excited. And at the same time, I was already taking ceramics and felt like I could understand the critters that I was studying better if I sculpted them because I'm like a three-dimensional learner. So I started sculpting corals from the second I started studying them and I, haven't stopped it's kind of funny and eccentric <laughs> it's really wonderful to see you know um some of the some of the artists that we've had throughout the year have such interesting niche work like you described like I sort of I was fascinated and I carved out this niche for myself but I imagine at least you know when I when I was a younger artist if someone had said pick a very finite niche I might have been intimidated by that yeah like does the world need this tiny thing but it's actually become this really large mm -hmm. realm of possibilities for you mm -hmm. um I guess do you have any you know I guess thoughts on thoughts on carving your artist niche in the world and what you might uh encourage the our high school artists here I think you're you're right on. I think you can't commit to something and be that bold and just sort of go in a direction without having it feel like a true passion and kind of trying alternatives. So I think it's important to experiment and to be open to possibilities. But if you find something that you just love to do, figure out how to make that your job. Like, don't give up. <laughs> um, I think I, I've been lucky to kind of have advisors and parents and mentors to support me to do that and not tell me to be more practical and just like yes. at some point I definitely in high school was still thinking like oh I should probably you know find a career in marine science and do art as a hobby and be really practical and then I just kept going and realized that I could make a difference and get people mm -hmm. to listen doing what I'm doing so it just all worked. Do you think um, do you find yourself particularly like coral will be your main point of focus for some time? Or is there, I mean, marine science being so vast, do you ever, are you like tempted to like plug a fish in there? You know, your, your big <laughs> blue fish friend that was there in the right. picture. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I think there's some, I still don't really know how to explain it, but there's something really interesting in animals that don't have faces. Um, yeah. I feel like representing the guys that don't have faces is really important to me. And I, I'm sure like psychologically, that's probably kind of a weird <laughs> quirk in my personality. But it's I like feel like the, the Lorax speaking for the trees, you speak for the coral. Yeah, yeah. I kind of feel like <laughs> a coral sometimes. I don't know. Um, but I also have noticed that when I'm snorkeling or diving with people that don't know a lot about reef ecology, they'll see Nemo or they'll see Dory in the reef and like make eye contact and be like, oh my God, the reef is so healthy. It's amazing. And they won't even notice that the entire reef itself of corals is dead and bleached and covered in algae. So mm -hmm. I think um, not including Nemo in there is kind of a good way to get people to both feel like the fish themselves and also look more closely at the maybe less charismatic critters that are behind the scenes. 
That's so interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we just have a few minutes left. Um, Ms. Hyken, I wanted to ask you if there was anything um, like pertinent to what your class is working on that you wanted to ask or anything more. Um, my, my specialty is not visual art, but Ms. Hyken knows what she's doing, so. Cool. Um, do you mind talking? I know you talked a little bit about like some of the or some of the tools you use for creating different surfaces. Like, can you talk a little bit more about maybe some other type of like surface techniques you've used or textures or adding clay? Um, that's something that we've been really exploring in this class. Yeah, one of the things that I have focused on a lot is creating a huge diversity of different kinds of textures. So I'm always looking for new tools and inventing my own tools um to create that diversity because that's what makes the reef look really natural um so i poke thousands of holes i have um i have my toolbox right here actually so i can show you um this thing is my favorite tool because it has like wires on it that can poke like maybe 10 holes at a time so i don't have to poke individual holes the good find um, for, like chopsticks to the 10 at once you know yeah yeah and I don't think they sell this anymore. So if I lose it, I'm dead, but <laughs> um, <laughs> you can also make like a bundle of toothpicks and do it that way. Um, so I use paint brushes. I use all kinds of different like texture molds and I don't do like mold making usually, but I'll have like kind of mold um, plates that I can press onto things. Um, and all the work I do is hollow. So I build really thin mm -hmm. so that the work is lightweight enough to hang on the wall safely. Um, so all my coil building that I do is maybe up to a half inch thick max. Um, and then the branches and different appendages and things are solid, obviously. So there's all those different connection points and um, that can pose challenges in terms of cracking. So I always try to um, I, I use a really amazing clay body that is really gritty and bulky. It has a lot of grog in it, so it doesn't shrink too much. I think it only shrinks like 5%. So um, that helps a lot to avoid cracking issues. And I just have my studio space is a concrete floor. And I found that drying work on the floor can help it dry more slowly because the floor keeps it really cool. Um, so that has been really helpful too. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, that brings us right about to the end of our period. Um, thank you so much, Courtney. This has been really lovely to see your work. And from, um, we, we were born in the same year I saw in your bio. And so yeah, nice. for, I, I always think about like our generation's obsession with marine biology. Like it was really yeah. the thing everyone wanted to be when they grow up and you took really? that to a very cool place. So, um, I really yeah. appreciate that. Kudos. Thanks. <laughs> Having right. fun. <laughs> students thank you for joining us um we've got courtney's um all of her social media accounts in the presentation um and on the website in her bio so if you want to follow along please do great there's, yes. there's thank you so much thank you see you later <laughs>